Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction House, and I'm taking a look at some of the guns that they're selling in their September 2015 premiere auction. And they happen to have a whole bunch of Merwin and Holbert revolvers. Now, you may not have heard of Merwin and Holbert. They never achieved all that much widespread popularity, despite the fact that they are arguably the best revolver of the Frontier era. So I have four different versions here, because with the, the cool variety that are, are available in this auction, I'm able to pick out um, a number of different models to show the evolution of the design. Now the one thing I'm not going to get into in this are the non-army style guns that Merwin and Hulbert made. They did have a whole line of 38 caliber small revolvers, and we're not even going to get into those. So let me start with a little bit of basic background. Uh, Joseph Merwin was the man behind these guns. The company was Mer Merwin and Hulbert. Well, the Hulbert brothers were basically his financial backing. Uh, they were apparently quite astute businessmen. They were quite good at what they did. Um, Merwin was the gun designer. You may recognize him from the Merwin and Bray revolvers, uh, Civil War era. Well, he, he kept tinkering about with various different things. In 1868, he and the Hulbert brothers formed this conglomerate company, Merwin, Hulbert, and Company. Um, they did an, a bunch of investing, uh, thanks, I'm sure, to the, the uh, know-how of the Hulberts. And by the time these guns were in production, the company actually was fairly well diversified. They, they had invested $100,000 in the Evans Rifle Company. The Evans, as you may recall, is this really kind of neat lever action that has a, uh, like a 32 or 40 round magazine in the buttstock. Um, they also owned a 50% interest in Hopkins and Allen. A, a very significant manufacturing company. And it was, in fact, Hopkins and Allen that manufactured these guns for Merwin and Hulbert. Now, Merwin, one of the, the basic design criteria that he had in mind when he devised these guns was strength and quality. Um, in particular, this, these were made around the time that reloading gear was actually becoming commonly available. And Merwin was legitimately so, concerned that people would overload cartridges and, and he wanted to make his gun strong enough that there wouldn't be any liability from them blowing up because of overpowered hand loads <coughs> or teeth. So we'll see a number of, of elements of that coming into his design. Uh, in fact, why don't I bring the camera back here? Let's just dive right into what is arguably the best cowboy revolver ever. All right, I sort of lied. We're actually going to start with this one. This is a very early first model Frontier revolver, so that's a good place to start. Now, I said Frontier uh, because that was, you can tell the, uh, the flat-bottomed grip here is indicative of the Frontier model from Merwin and Hulbert. This has a 7-inch barrel, which was a standard barrel length for them, and it is single action, so we can tell that by the fact that the trigger uh, is a very, has a very short travel to it. Single action was typical of the time, although Merwin and Hulbert would come out with some double action guns. We'll see those in a minute. In order to load the gun, you put it at half cock, and we have a loading gate right here that pulls straight down, and then load one at a time. Loading gate comes back up. So there are three main mechanical elements that really make the Merwin stand out from its competitors. So let's take a look at those. To unload the gun, you push this stud back, and you can then rotate the barrel assembly 90 degrees on, on its center axis pin. When you pull the, the assembly forward, the cylinder comes with it. All six cases are extracted simultaneously. So this is as fast to unload as a top brake revolver, although it still requires loading through the gate here. Now, we need to take a little bit of a closer look at this to see how it works, because you may notice there's no uh, extractor star. So how do the cases come out? Well. The cases, the bit of the rim is actually lodged underneath this flange on the back of the frame. So when I put this all the way down, you can see that the cylinder is tight up there. That's why the gun has to be loaded through this loading gate. So when you load cartridges here, the rim sits on top of that flange. You can see if I go to open it here, that little flange right there, that acts as our extractor. Now, if you were watching closely when I opened this, you will notice the, the second main mechanical uh, feature of the Merwin. There is a cam in the axis pin so that this last bit of travel, when I'm rotating the barrel open, pulls the cylinder forward just slightly. 
that is designed to be primary extraction. So the idea is, in particular with early uh, copper cartridges, the cases could often expand enough, they, they would expand but not then contract sufficiently and they'd be very tight in the cylinders. If you had something like a single action Colt with an ejector rod, it was hard to get those out because you, all you had was an ejector rod that hammer on the, the back of the case. Well with the Merwin, you've got this little camming action that pops the seal on the fired cartridges if they're stuck. Then you can pull them out straight. Now the third element is really clever and it's something that you can't necessarily see on video. Um, unfortunately I don't have a, a combination of live ammo and empty cases to demonstrate with, but what I can tell you is that the length of this travel is actually less than the overall length of a loaded cartridge. Um, I should backtrack and say these very first guns were offered in 44 Merwin and Hulbert, which was pretty similar to 44 Russian, but a little bit longer. If you had a loaded case, let's say you, you loaded six rounds and you fired well, three of them. When you opened this up, the empty brass was short enough that it would fall out. The intact loaded cartridges were long enough that they would not. The rim would stay stuck under here and the nose of the bullet would remain just slightly inside the cylinder. The upshot of this is if you fired three rounds and wanted to top off the gun, when you pop it open, your three empty cases fall out, your three live rounds stay in the gun. Really a very clever mechanical system. Now the other thing that doesn't really come across on video is just how Im immaculately manufactured these guns are. Even when they're worn on the outside, and, and this one frankly is a pretty good example, the fit between the axis pin and the barrel assembly is remarkably smooth. So much so that when you open or close it, the mechanical fit creates just a little bit of vacuum. Now this one's a bit worn. I'll demonstrate on one of the later guns. You can really actually get an audio idea of how tight that fit is and how smooth they are. Now the disassembly mechanism remained constant on these guns, so I'll demonstrate that with this one as well. Um, the one thing that did change, this is a first model Frontier, and one of the distinguishing features of that is it has this little tiny detent on this takedown lever. So this lever allows us to pull the barrel off. What I do is open it up and then I have to push in that detent and then push this lever down. And then the barrel and the cylinder pop right off. No tools required. So cylinder is, is very simple. We've pretty much already seen that. So this angle right here is the camming surface that is there to break cartridges free. And then there's a cut here on the end of the axis pin. That cut mates up with this barrel wedge to ensure that the barrel is solidly locked into the gun. So when the barrel's in place, you can see that that cutout is directly in line with the barrel wedge. So that's a strengthening feature. All right, let's go ahead and move on to a second model, which is, has a number of differences to it. You'll see this is still an open-topped gun. This is a second model of Merwin and Hulbert. It is also in a pocket army instead of a frontier. The, the obvious visual difference, the frontier has the flat-bottomed grip. The pocket army has a bird's head with, um, well some books call it a crested bird's head with this extra finger loop. Some people call this a skull crusher grip for hitting folks on the head with. I'm not sure that was, it may or may not have been the original intent. At any rate, uh, with this bird's head grip, this model is referred to as a pocket army, despite the fact that it really isn't a pocket gun so much, except in comparison to the much larger Frontier. This has a three and a half inch barrel. That was also, that was the other standard barrel length for Merwin and Hulbert. Now, the distinction with the second model is actually fairly subtle. General mechanics work the same way. Put the gun at half cock and pop this open. And we have all the same mechanical features. The recoil bolt has been improved and there's no longer an open uh, plate down here that you have to, to get into to do some of the maintenance on the gun. Uh, I should show you that. Here on the first model, this is a removable plate. Here on the second model, it's not, it's a solid frame. Now one of the other changes that the second model made, the first model guns were all offered in 44 Merwin and Hulbert, which is of course impossible to get today. Yeah, I'm sure you could hand load it, but with the second model, they started offering these in 4440, or as it's marked here, caliber 1873 Winchester. 
Um, that made the guns, uh, gave them a wider market because the, the 44 40, 40 cartridge was very popular and easily accessible everywhere. So the other thing that I want to point out with this one, obviously the outside is not in as good of condition, but it is engraved. And in fact, you'll notice if you start keeping your eyes out for a lot of Merwin and Hulberts that there seem to be a remarkable number of engraved examples. There's good reason for that. The company actually came up with an engraving method that was largely mechanical. It involved basically pin punches instead of a handheld engraving tool. That allowed them to offer en engraved guns from the factory at a very reasonable price point. If you were simply you know, a reasonably middle class sort of person who wanted a fancy gun, you could afford an engraved Merwin and Hulbert. If you wanted an engraved example of a Colt or a Remington, well that was all hand done work and that was much more expensive. So for that reason you'll find a lot of engraved Merwins out there from people who simply wanted to have, they appreciated the fact that they had the best mechanical revolver on the market and they wanted it to be one of the best looking ones as well. So enough of the second model here, let's move on to the third model. So we have two examples here of the third model of Merwin and Hulbert. The top one here is a Frontier. There will be a quiz at the end I suppose. The Frontier has the flat grip. The second one has the bird's head grip which would make it a pocket army model. Um, what's really distinctive about the third model is that they finally introduced a top strap. So the barrel wedge up here is gone. That's no longer necessary because now the barrel is held in place down here and up at the top. That being said, it still retains the same mechanism. Put the gun at half cock, pull this back, and it opens to extract and eject. Now this particular example is also in 4440 caliber. It has this very frightened looking deer on it. Some of the engraving, in fact the, the engraving patterns vary quite a bit and some of them are a bit entertaining. Um, this again has a three inch barrel. I think you could make a very substantial argument that this gun, this exact model, would have been the best firearm in the Old West. It's got the strength of a, uh, a solid frame revolver. It's got the reloading, ejecting and reloading speed of the fastest top brake guns. Um, has a very convenient short barrel. This is really the epitome of the ideal Old West gunfighter's pistol. Now we do also have this version. The clever eyed viewer will have noticed that there is something different about the trigger here. This is a double action version of the Merwin and Halbert. I mentioned that they did make these. Well this is a third model double action Frontier. Uh, now I believe this one, yes, this is also in caliber 4440. Again that's marked Winchester 1873 because that's uh, when the cartridge came out and how it was often designated. Uh, all right, I had mentioned, uh, I had kind of hyped the quality of the machine fit between the barrel and the access pin. And this is the gun that I want to demonstrate it to you with. Now if you look at this gun closely, frankly the finish is mm, it's not in real good shape. That's an awfully brown cylinder. There's a lot of surface pitting, the nickels coming off. You would think this is not a particularly well cared for gun. And yet internally it is still magnificent at least the action is. So uh, being double action I cock the hammer all the way back to, to free it up to reload. Push this in, pull this back and what I'm going to do is actually point the barrel down and there is enough of a vacuum created by the mechanical fit that it actually pulls the barrel back under vacuum until it's, that vacuum slowly leaks out and it comes all the way forward. So there we have an, a basic introduction to the 44 caliber Merwin and Hulbert. There are a lot of other guns that the company made over the course of its business lifespan, uh, but that lifespan was frankly pretty short. The company was out of business by 1880 or 1881. This was largely due actually to the death of Joseph Merwin in 1879. Um, and the company was in pretty dire financial straits at that point for reasons that had nothing to do with the quality of its guns. Unfortunately, that $100,000 in the Evans Rifle Company had been a bad idea because the Evans failed to be a commercial success. Uh, and there were three major shipments of Merwin and Hulbert revolvers to Russia that ultimately were never paid for. Um, the company was having some issues. It was, these guns were tested by the US military, which found all of the, the strengths that I've gone over with you, but 
the Army didn't think that they were a, enough of an improvement over the 1873 Colt to be worth changing over to. Uh, and that may have been as much politics as mechanics, but ultimately didn't make a difference to Merwin because the Army didn't adopt his guns. Thanks for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the video. These are fantastic guns that just really don't get very much recognition. They didn't in the day, they still don't today, and it's really a shame because they're great guns. Uh, in addition to these four, there are a number of others here in the auction. I have links in the text description below to these. I'll leave it up to you to browse around the auction catalog and find the others if you're interested in them. Thanks for watching.